All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 65, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, today we got some stuff, uh, primarily libraries and demos. There is actually a bunch of pretty major releases this week around. So I'm not sure why, but uh, hey, there you go. And uh, we got some news, some getting started articles and some uh, tiny, awesome tips and tricks. So let's get cracking. Uh, first, the getting started section. The first article we got here today is React component lifecycle with hooks. If you are getting started with the React or maybe you work with the legacy React, uh, but thinking about moving into React hooks, but don't quite understand how exactly does the component lifecycle from the comp classes uh, translates into the hooks, this article is for you. So if you're interested, do check it out. It does a pretty good job explaining how exactly it works. I should probably slow down because I feel like I'm going a bit too fast. <clears throat> Let's try this again. So the second article we got here is handling errors in Vue.js. It's a pretty comprehensive guide on uh, figuring out the errors in Vue.js and how to handle them within components and within your app itself. So if you're working with Vue and not quite sure how to work with errors, do check this one out. Next one we got here is Vue.js and SEO how to optimize reactive websites for search engines and bots. Let's talk specifically about optimization of uh, Vue.js and what to keep in mind uh, with regards to SEO when building uh, websites using Vue. Uh, so yes, I guess if you're doing that, do check this one out. It's a pretty comprehensive guide. Uh, hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. All right. Continuing, we got unit testing in Angular, pretty much everything you need to know about testing, I guess, all the parts of Angular JS, starting from the utilities, going to the pipes, services, directives, uh, components, and even guards, I believe, if I remember correctly. So if you are working with um, Angular JS, and you are still not quite sure on how the testing works, and how to use it specifically to test those parts, then do check this guide out, it is quite good. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got how to migrate from higher order components to hooks, a tutorial that guides you through a very basic change of, you know, taking a higher order component and rewriting it using the new React hooks. Uh, again, if you already know how the hooks works, you won't really find anything useful here. If you are just getting into it and you still are not quite sure how to hooks replace higher order components, then this guide got everything for you. So do check this one out. Next thing we got here is TypeScript interface versus type. This is um, introduction, I guess, to uh, TypeScript interfaces and types and how are they different and when exactly do you use one and when do you use another one. So if you are using TypeScript and I guess getting started, do check this one out. It's pretty good. And it's also quite short, actually. So the difference is not that big. But uh, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is testing with Svelte and Ava. A pretty nice tutorial uh, that is also not too long on how to test your uh, Svelte applications using Ava. And um, yeah, it's it's actually really straightforward as it turns out. So uh, we did I did the Svelte live stream this week and by default Svelte comes with a Cypress, which I mean, it seems to work amazing, but it is very big library, right? So Ava is very, uh, very much more smaller and simpler to set up and doesn't require you to download like half of, uh, um, I guess, what was it? I don't know, I'm not sure how big the Cypress is, I guess like half of a gigabyte or something. So yes, it just mocks the browser environment and then you can just run your test, which looks quite nice. So if you're curious as to how that is done, check out this article. All right, next thing we got here is React for Vue developers. Another article that guides, uh, you know, people as how to react is different or similar from Vue in this case. So if you're working with Vue.js, but was thinking about a jumping ship to react or maybe exploring react as a alternative or expanding your horizon, so to say, then do check this article out. It basically covers everything you have to know, uh, you know, going from templates, props, data to computed properties and so on and so forth. So if you're curious about react as a Vue developer, this article does a great job of um, outlining it basically. All right, continuing, we got functional JavaScript, five ways to calculate an average with reduce, uh, array.reduce. Uh, yeah, this is exactly as the title says, it talks about using array.reduce for calculating averages. Uh, it's a pretty good tutorial to the array.reduce itself. 
So if you are just getting started with JavaScript in general, and maybe array uh, iteration specifically, because I know it's a tricky topic. And I, I think it took me a few years to actually learn the map filter and reduce properly. But there you go. This one does a really good job of uh, outlining how the reduce works and when they use it and how exactly do you apply it to specifically calculate an average. Love the website style. Yes, it is a very fancy website style. <laughs> I totally agree with that. Um, but yeah, there we go. All right, continuing, we got you don't need passport JS guide to Node.js authentication. Um, I, I mean, I would not agree with you don't need passport JS guides. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of going, you know, you don't roll your own authentication and so on and so forth. But uh, article itself just talks about writing your own authentication system, right, which is perfectly fine. Um, this one specifically talks about using JSON web tokens and MongoDB to store the data. It's quite good. I just want to note one tiny thing over here that just irks me. The author of the article uh, generates the random salt for each user, right, to hash the password, and then stores this salt right next to the password, which is, um, I mean, it's a bit of a disaster in my opinion, because normally you have the salt that protects your passwords, right? So if the database is hacked and leaked, then attacker will have a hard time decrypting your passwords, uh, assuming you used a strong enough encryption. In this way, it's basically like, hey, here's a salted password and here's a salt right next to it. So what's the point in salting it? You can, you might as well just store it as a plain text. <laughs> I'm not sure what's the reasoning behind it because I don't think author uh, actually speaks about that anywhere in the article, aside from saying, hey, you know, we're actually gonna store it there. Author does say that you should not send password and salt or like, I guess, salt to the clients and password as well. But in this case, you know, it's salted, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, it's like, uh, it's it's a bit, a bit iffy. So don't store your salt in a database. That's a terrible idea because if your database gets hacked, then all your passwords are essentially leaked, right? Because it's quite easy to figure out the algorithm used for hashing and then you already have the salt. So what? That's quite easy to reverse. Uh, but yes, uh, other than that, the article is actually quite good. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is five programming patterns I like. Um, the, yeah, it's just a description of five neat programming patterns, uh, specifically with regards to JavaScript, like early returns, switch to object literal, uh, and yeah, like uh, using one uh, loop for two arrays and so on and so on. Like there's, you know, five of them that are quite typical, but I guess if you're just getting started, you will probably uh, find something new here. Uh, if you've already been developing for a couple of years, there's probably not going to be anything uh, eye opening in here. Okay, continuing, we got 12 tips for writing clean and scalable JavaScript. Again, this is a really good article for the JavaScript beginners, because if you've been writing for at least a couple of years, you won't find anything new in here. There's some pretty straightforward um, suggestions like, you know, modularization, um, more verbose parameters and destructing to named parameters and stuff like this. So it's, it's quite straightforward. But if you are just getting started, it's actually really good. So do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is creating your own React validation library, three part article talking about form validation specifically in React and how do you uh, roll your own version. Um, the cool part here is that it's actually written using hooks. So it's quite fresh and uh, it's actually very well written. So if you are working with forms a lot in React and wanted to do your own React validation library, then um, with hooks specifically, then do check this one out. Seems to be quite good. All right, next thing we got here is four patterns for global state with React hooks, context or Redux. Um, yet another article talking about the ways to uh, share state within the React app. As usual, we have the props drilling, we have the context, uh, multiple contexts, and then using Redux. So if you're getting started with the React and still confused as to how you can actually share the state between components, do check this one out. It does a good job of introducing all the possible options. All right, uh, now we're coming to the articles and news, more in-depth guides. The first one we got here today is transducers, a generalized concept for data transformation. It's a really good and uh, quite in-depth article with a uh, pretty good examples that basically introduces the concept of transducers and how exactly you can use them for uh, data transformation, right? Again, all the code is in JavaScript. 
uh, or I guess uh, TypeScript as well. And uh, it is very easy to understand. And the author uh, sort of uh, outlines the journey from just using map and filter to transducers and why transducers are actually very useful. So if you're curious about the whole functional programming uh, area and transducers specifically, do check this article out. It is quite good and does a very good job of explaining how are they useful and why should you use them specifically. So yeah. All right, next thing we got here is compiling C to WebAssembly without mscripten. Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite ones this week. Um, so yeah, the idea is that we got this mscripten, which is the tool chain for C, C++ that targets WebAssembly, right? This is what you typically see people use when they take a C library and then compile it to WebAssembly. Um, mscripten is great, but the problem is it does actually introduce a bunch of overhead. Uh, including the mscript environment and so on and so forth. And uh, the author was like, okay, so let's use LLVM to compile C to WebAssembly directly, which is, I mean, it's something you can do, right? So LLVM, since the one of the latest versions has the uh, WebAssembly as the, one of the targets. So yes, this is possible. And yes, you will use command line a lot, but it's still really awesome. So the idea is that you take your C code. So in this case, um, he wrote a really simple add function that uh, adds two um, integers, right? Uh, then you take this uh, C code and compile it into LLVM IR code, uh, right? And then after doing that, you transform IR into object files. Then you can take this object file and you can link it into the WebAssembly. It is <laughs> like, I guess you wouldn't actually want to do this on a regular basis, but it's really cool that the fact that you can actually do that. And then you can really just fetch this WebAssembly module and use it in the, um, in your uh, JavaScript, which is kind of cool. There is, um, better like description. So like as, as the author notes here, compiling C the slightly less hard way. So with the less steps, with more optimizations and stuff like this. Uh, there's also additional um, extension here on uh, talking about calling into the standard library and using the dynamic memory that is uh, basically passed to the um, uh, JavaScript. So again, you know, I think that's a really, really good introduction to uh, specifically com compiling C to WebAssembly without relying on mscript and doing it yourself. And again, introduction to the shared memory and stuff like this. So if you have any interest in WebAssembly, I would highly recommend reading this one. It's really, really cool. All right, continuing, we got enabling modern JavaScript on NPM. Um, so this article talks about the future of modules, I guess, on NPM, right? So right now we got all of these NPM modules that we are kind of used to and all of them are ES5 typically, right? So you rarely have any ESM modules there and even rarer something that is sort of combines both, right? But with the modern browsers and the modern tooling, you actually want to have two builds, right? So you want to have the module and no module pattern, for example, which is quite widely used, I believe, right now, which means that if you have the module, ES modules, then you have the more modern version of JavaScript built into a separate bundle. And if you have no module, you have the legacy ES5 bundle that is basically used in all the other browsers. Now the problem, so this is the article from, um, Jason Miller, the uh, he's goes by develop it on um, GitHub and Twitter. And he's the author of Preact and a bunch of other uh, tools like Microbundle and other some really good tooling there, right. And um, so the, the problem that he talks about is that the modern modules, they don't actually support the way to build two completely different bundles, right. That would be one would be for modern uh, browsers and the other one would be for legacy or maybe even more split, you know, with this, um, the module that we talked about it a few podcasts ago, there was this uh, suggestion from, I believe it was from the Chrome team to add a specific, um, ES version, uh, property to the script tag that would limit the script tag, uh, to the specific subset of the features that browser supports. Right. So even though. It is like, um, basically the, the gist here is that um, the current way we publish modules and NPM doesn't really, wouldn't really work in the long run because you won't be able to target more modern browsers, for example, and at the same time, create a legacy 
bundle with ease, right? Because the modern tooling is just not built around that idea. And there's a problems with that, like for example, uh, Webpack recommends, and Rollup as well, recommends disabling Babel transpilation for node modules because they expect the node modules to already be ES5, which again, works really well for legacy stuff, but will not work once ES modules are widely supported, uh, which is a bit of a problem. There's also a suggested solution over here, which is quite interesting. So if the whole problem, you know, the whole um, issue of the enabling, again, modern JavaScript on NPM sounds interesting to you, I would highly recommend checking this article out because there's some really interesting thoughts in here. And I, I actually, prior to reading this, I haven't even thought about that, you know, this, this is actually a problem, but uh, yeah gonna have to deal with that somehow. And there's some uh, pretty good suggested solutions here too. So do check this one out. All right, continuing, we got building a multi streaming Alexa skill with Alexa skills kit. It's a pretty neat tutorial um, that shows you how to build your own Alexa skill that would do Alexa play radio station name. And uh, not just, you know, sp specific Alexa code, but it also shows you how to deploy it on Amazon Web Services Lambda how to uh, create your uh, DynamoDB tables with the radio stations and stuff like this. Pretty in depth, pretty good. And uh, yeah, if you ever wanted to build your own Alexa skill and deploy it on a Amazon Web Services as a serverless thing, then there you go. You can actually do that right now in about 10 minutes. It's actually really straightforward, turns out. Um, but yeah, check it out if that sounds interesting. <coughs> Apologies. All right, continuing, we got uh, better apps with React server-side rendering. Uh, this is an article I did not expect to see. So this is actually from Riot Games. If you are playing video games, you might heard about them. They are the creator of League of Legends, one's, uh, one of the most popular ones, I believe, uh, video games right now. And um, turns out they have a technology blog and this time around they published an article about React and server-side rendering. So this is mostly non-technical article, although there are some tiny technical bits, but it is mostly talks about the concepts, you know, so how does the, why, why is SSR important? How does it work in their stuff? What is the problems with rolling it with React? What are the benefits of doing that? And what are the drawbacks? And how do you do that? How do you set it up yourself? Uh, it's quite interesting. Again, there's not much code. There is some, there's a bit of sort of technical discussion, but in general, again, it comes down to the architecture concepts and overall implications of doing server-side rendering. So if we're getting into that, I would highly recommend reading it. There are some pretty cool uh, things here and some interesting insights from the, I guess, you know, large enough company that rolls that um, for a large enough server. So yes, quite interesting. Definitely check this one out. All right, continuing, we got front end documentation, style guides and rise of MDX. Um, yeah, it's, it's an introduction to MDX uh, and introduction to writing documentation with a bunch of different tools that support MDX. How you can do that and why you should opt into MDX instead of writing basic markdown, which could be immensely useful for, uh, for example, React components. So if you are working with them, do check it out. It's uh, actually a pretty good introduction. All right, uh, that is it for the articles. Now we're coming to the tiny bits and uh, small awesome things. The first one we got here is point cloud effect in 3DS, a very basic tutorial that shows you how to import your own model and then render it as a point cloud, which looks quite fancy actually. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's uh, really neat and you know, 3GS seems to make it incredibly easy, so there you go. All right, next thing we got here is why I'm still using jQuery in 2019. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, the title says everything. It's an article that talks about why it's still okay to use jQuery in 2019. I totally agree with the author, sometimes it's okay, right? It's, it's not like you have to use Vue or React for everything and sometimes, a bit of jQuery doesn't hurt. And uh, it's like, what, what amazed me, there's a bunch of discussions of this article on Hacker News, on Reddit, or you know, wherever, there's like a bunch of forums. And almost everywhere, there are people who say that it's bad to use jQuery. Like, why don't, I just don't get it. Why is it bad? Like, yes, it's kind of large-ish, but then again, you know, 30 kilobytes and you got, or, or like, as the author notes here, you can actually 
trim it down to 17 kilobytes if you remove things like you know to do the custom build without like ajax and all the other stuff but you get the complete support for the older browsers and you get the simple familiar api um so yes it might be okay in quite a lot of cases and i just don't get why people just you know basically scream in the comments that it is bad and you should no longer use jquery in 2019 which is just doesn't make any sense so yeah if you're curious do check it out there's some solid reasoning in here um if 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 that doesn't sound interesting well just skip it i mean it's not that long you know all right next thing we got here is in native run WebAssembly outside the sandbox at 95 percent speed now this is uh, pretty awesome so the developers here thought you know we have this WebAssembly, which is a really cool format uh, but the problem is WebAssembly always runs within the sandbox right so there's actually in addition to the runtime you got the sandbox which makes sure that WebAssembly doesn't do anything malicious because it's part of the browser and we don't really want websites screwing with our system. Uh, now the author here, uh, the developers here uh, thought, okay, so what happens if we actually take WebAssembly and remove the sandbox? So what if we run it without sandboxing uh, just natively and see what kind of speed can we achieve? Uh, and they build this in native, which is an ahead of time compiler for WebAssembly that uses LLVM. Uh, with a customizable level of sandboxing, which is also interesting. So you can basically opt in into specific uh, sandboxing features, I guess. And they compare it using benchmarks with uh, C++, debugging, strict mode, sandboxing, and native. And um, it is actually surprising because when you run it without any sandboxing, so you just basically disable all the features, um, WebAssembly runs you know, just 5% slower than native C, C++ benchmarks, which is pretty mind blowing, to be honest. And in this case, it actually runs 3% faster than C, C++ code, which is, I, I, I mean, interesting, I would say. <laughs> I'll be curious as to why is that? Is it because of the ahead of time compilation or something? But it's, it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, so this is the thing it exists. And uh, not just not just that, right? So the cool thing is that disabling the sandboxing actually allows WebAssembly to interface directly with the operating system. So here's a screenshot of a WebAssembly module that uses Win32 API to create a UI window, which, which is just mind blowing. Um, as some people in discussions noted, it seems like WebAssembly is sort of moving to replace the JVM. And um, it would be very interesting to see if we finally get the thing that JVM promised, you know, write once, run everywhere thing. Because it's sort of slow, very slowly moving towards that direction. But it's a really cool experiment. And I will be very curious to see how this will end. Uh, if, if that sounds interesting, do check out in native that seems to be really awesome. All right, next thing we got here is CK Editor 4. Um, they've I'm not sure if they just released it or if it was around, they just did a write up. But basically, CK Editor 4 is, you know, the CK Editor has been around for ages. I think the first time I've used it was back in 2008, 9, whatever. It was like ages ago. And um, it's, it's a really nice, what you see is what you get, editor. Uh, but it's been a bit of a pain in ass to integrate with React. And now it seems like they have the React component that basically allows you to just import it and use it within your app with just a simple tag. So if you are curious, if you're working with what you see and what you get editing, then do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. All right, next thing we got here is JavaScript and evidence-based language design, a write-up from Mozilla Hacks uh, guys. And uh, so this one is actually a request to fill out a survey. And uh, if you are invested into JavaScript, let's put it this way, I would suggest that you go and fill out the survey. It's really short. It basically talks about the pipeline operator and asks, is, is, you know, how do you feel about it? Is it easier to understand what the problems are there? Is it easier to spot the bugs with it and stuff like this, which is also quite interesting, actually. I found to answer these uh, questions to be quite curious because it turns out that it is way easier to detect syntax error within the pipeline operator code rather than with just function calls, which was surprising to me, honestly. But um, yeah, if you are curious about the pipeline operator and you have like 10 minutes to answer the survey, please go ahead and do so because this will help TC39 quite a lot. And I really, I honestly hope they will ship the pipeline operator soon because it was 
It was quite cool. Like, I really like writing code like this. <laughs> there we go. All right, next thing we got here is what's new in DevTools Chrome 76. And uh, aside from, you know, um, quality of life features like autocomplete from the values, when you type bold, it will automatically figure out that it's going to be font weight bold, for example. There's some new UI rework for the networking tab, uh, the web socket messages now included in HR. HAR exports, but all of that is like cool and stuff. Now, what I want to note here is the thing that they've added in the end, which is not exactly related to the Chrome DevTools, but they've actually started working on Puppeteer for Firefox. So um, yeah, so soon we're going to get the same API the Puppeteer has, but it's going to be running on top of Firefox and you're going to be able to use Puppeteer to run your automated scripts and boss both uh, Firefox and Chromium, which is kind of awesome. So uh, if you are interested, do check out the video here. I believe there's a source code somewhere as well. So it is uh, definitely looking damn good. All right, next thing we got here is URQL uh, grown up or is it or Oracle? I'm not sure how to read that correctly, but uh, there you go. So this is a GraphQL client and they just released a new documentation website for it. Um, still no download support for Puppeteer. That is a good question. I actually haven't tracked that. So you might check that yourself in the, I mean, let's let's just go ahead and puppy, Puppeteer, Puppeteer download file. You can kind of fake that yourself, right? So if you uh, eject the URL outside of Puppeteer, you can just do that through the node site, uh, which works just fine. But uh, the ticket seems to be still open for some reason. There's like a ton of discussion in here. How hard could it be to add a download thing? Um, navigate to URL, click a download link, new tab pops up, download stars there, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> So it seems like there's no like pro official way of doing that, but this is, yeah, this is basically the way I used as well. So you can write a download function that is external and done in Node.js, and then you can just use HTTP get and FS create write stream and just, you know, do it yourself essentially. That worked perfectly fine for me. And essentially from the page, you just call the external function and that's it. Um, other than that, yeah, it seems like a still, there's still some discussion going in said, Oh, no, they do have they seem to have shipped some API, but I'm not sure why is this still open. But anyway, uh, like there are ways to do that is just seems to be still a bit confusing to majority of people. <laughs> okay, coming back to URQL. Um, I'm scared that some file resources may work like how unexpected that you're literally just getting a HTTP request and streaming it to a file, right? Like what, what do you expect to go wrong in there? It's, it sounds like it's really hard to screw up, you know, streaming file from internet to hard drive, to be honest. So I would not be afraid of anything here. Single time download resource. Yeah. So if it's single time, you just re-request the download URL and do it again. Right. So I don't think that's a big problem. Captcha is a different problem. Like this is, this is something that is actually hard to automate, right? Because I mean, I like, I don't know, like Captcha is, it means that it, it's actually not made for robots. So you should like, I guess, I mean, there are ways around it, obviously, but I don't know. Okay, coming back to our URQL uh, library. Now, this is a pretty cool library that um, introduces the hooks API that you can use to fetch data. That actually looks pretty cool. So here's this tiny snippet, basically allows you to do use to use use query hook uh, that passes the query, which uh, get response, um, which is the, um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's kind of like a promise, but not really a promise, I guess, because <laughs> it has statuses and then it has the data field that you can iterate over to show it. Now, the interesting thing is that they have this use mutation hook where you can pass the mutation query and then you get the actions that actually can be used as a basic functions, which looks incredibly handy. So if you're working with GraphQL and React, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. All right. The next cool thing we got here is the new feature that's going to be introduced into VS Code's uh, browser preview 
Uh, it's called inspect element and it literally allows you to go from the element in browser when you are debugging something in VS Code uh, to the source code in the VS Code. So you literally just click a button, focus the component and the VS Code will open the source code which looks absolutely damn awesome. So yeah, if you're using VS Code and uh, working a lot with the front ends, then definitely check this one out. This seems to be quite damn handy. All right. Uh, last thing we got here today is actually the fact that on May 27th, Node.js celebrated 10 years. It was, yeah, it's like <laughs> time death, time flies. So I, I didn't actually pick up Node.js, I think a year after it was originally released, but I can now basically boast that I have nine years of experience with Node.js. <laughs> Hey, and yes, um, there's already jokes about recruiters who are looking for 15 years of experience because of course there are things like this, but um, there you go. Okay, uh, now we're coming to the releases section. And there is quite a bunch of pretty major releases this time around. The first one is Angular 8, which, uh, well, introduces quite a lot of changes. So they have the differential loading now enabled by default, which is supposed to do automated code splitting into modern legacy JS, something we talked about before in the article about the enabling uh, modern JavaScript and NPM. Um, they seem to be already following through basically on this approach, which actually looks really cool. Um, so yeah, they uh, basically have the route configurations uh, to use dynamic imports. So you can now do uh, dynamic code splitting and loading in Angular with ease it seems some additional changes to CLI. They added the web worker support, which is also kind of great. And there's obviously a guide on, uh, you know, deprecation migrating and stuff like this. So if you're using Angular, make sure to check it out. This seems to be a pretty cool release. Uh, next thing we got here is TypeScript 3.5, which is again, minor release. So there's not that many uh, amazing changes. I mean, I guess they are amazing. They're just not mind blowing. So the majority of changes seems to be related to speed and uh, developer experience improvements. And uh, there is some interesting editor tooling improvements, which are also included in the language itself. For some reason, uh, the smart select is actually pretty cool. Um, there's yeah, also like stuff like extract type to alias in VS code, which also looks really awesome. So if you're working with TypeScript, make sure to check this one out. All right. Next release we got here is Graph IQL Explorer 2.0, a new version of Graph IQL Explorer that is, I believe, included into Gatsby by default. Um, yeah, the new release basically brings more features that look pretty cool. So if you are working with GraphQL and uh, maybe with Gatsby, you will probably already know about it. So definitely check out the new version. Seems to have a lot of pretty cool features. Next thing we got here is Verdaccio 4, which is the um, private NPM registry that you can roll your own. It's I've used version two, I believe. Uh, it's quite good. So if you need a private registry somewhere within intranet, it's really easy to set up and has a very fancy UI and can mirror the NPM and works really well. And now it's version four with a bunch of improvements. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> can't really complain about anything. Looks great. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Papa Pars version five. We talked about it. Uh, I don't remember, like two or three podcasts ago about version four, which had an absolutely amazing website. And now there is the version five, which again, the breaking change is basically dropping the node six and older. Um, and there's a bunch of changes that seems to be non breaking actually, which is kind of great. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, parsing CSV files very fast, then do check it out. It seems to be a great library. Bad memories from Verdaccio. I remember it used to be very iffy at version one and we had some problems with it as well. But once the version two came out, it actually became way more stable. So maybe you should revisit it. Those seems to be quite uh, nicely maintained now. So I assume there's going to be a bit like a lot less problems right now. But okay, continuing, we got Node.js version 10.16 LTS release uh, with a bunch of upgrades. And the primary highlight, at least for me, is the um, broadly support that has been added there and the top level await uh, for await off um, in REPL if you are using that, which is quite exciting. And uh, yes, that's basically it. So if you are running LTS, make sure to upgrade. And next release we got here is Ember 3.10, uh, 
I, for the life of me, don't know anything about Ember and never used it, so cannot really comment on anything here, but there seems to be quite a lot of changes in here. So if you are using Ember, make sure to check this one out. Next release we got here is Nux.js version 2.8 with a bunch of uh, fancier developer experience improvements, like for example, grouping of server sites, rendering logs uh, to um, um, avoid polluting the browser console. Actually, I didn't know they've rendered the SSR logs in the console, which is actually very convenient. Um, I, I don't know, if, I don't think Next.js actually does that. Uh, this is a feature I would actually love to see because switching back and forth to the uh, terminal sometimes can be a bit annoying when you just want SSR logs. Oh yeah, there's like a bunch of other changes, minor changes, uh, features and bug fixes. So if you're using Nux.js, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is Preact 10 Beta 2. Uh, adds experimental suspense and lazy support, uh, improves the speed of hydration and uh, a lot of bug fixes basically. So the core release here is for suspense. So if you're using Preact and wanted to try out the suspense and lazy, now you can do that with the beta version. Um, right, before I forget, there is JSConf EU going on right now. There is already a ton of really cool content out there. I'm definitely going to be talking about that during the next podcast. But if you can't wait, then definitely check out the Twitter and the JSConf EU uh, website, I guess. There seems to be quite a lot of really cool talks in there. All right, uh, now we are coming to the libraries and demos section. We got a whole ton of things today. Uh, the first one we got here is uh, MD Svex. I'm, I'm not sure how to read that, but let's call it MD Svex. So this is a markdown preprocessor for Svelte, and it literally allows you to write your pages, Svelte pages, using uh, markdown. And um, you have to use .svexy uh, file extension, uh, but it looks so good. Like you literally can take uh, Svelte components and then put Markdown inside of them and it will actually render them properly, which just looks really awesome. And then again, yeah, you can use, use Markdown anywhere or you can use components within Markdown. It seems to be awesome. So if you're working with Svelte and uh, interested in Markdown, then check this one out. Hi Dev Geek, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, next library we got here is React Vertex, a hook-based WebGL library for React. Now, this one is really cool. It actually allows you to build uh, 3D things using React component, which looks damn impressive, to be honest. And if you look at the source code, the whole uh, tuna is actually built using pure React, which is, I mean, this is kind of insane. I, I don't know what kind of black magic this is, but uh, yes, you can like you can you can you can do things like this. You can do sharks with React. Who wouldn't want to do sharks with React? So yes, if you are working with WebGL and you wanted to use it from React and build it using hooks, and yeah, that's like uh, it, it looks really cool. Just check it out. Like this is really awesome. So um, all right. Anyway, <laughs> this is React Vertex. Yeah, continuing. We got left, a uh, distractionless writing app. This um, electron-based writing app that seems to be relatively popular um, for some reason, I don't know. I'm, I typically don't use stuff like this, but uh, looks quite interesting. So if you are into the whole like Zen mode, distractionless writing stuff, do check it out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is X styled consistent theme based CSS for styled components. So this is an extension of styled components, as you might have guessed, that allows you to do themed components, which actually looks pretty cool. So if you're working with styled components and wanted to a simple way, I guess, to introduce themes, then do check this one out. It seems to be relatively easy to set up and provides basically everything you ever wanted um, by using template literals as usual, you know. All right, next thing we got here is CodeSpeak, a pretty neat experiment on doing web-based speech-to-code editor for humans. Uh, there was a very, so like the, the project itself is basically, you know, you go to codespeak.io, you turn on your microphone and then you can start saying things and it will type stuff for you like, print hello world or define a function or define a variable. There was a very interesting discussion on Hacker News about this. It's, it's apparently a lot of people have been trying out to build something similar to this. And it always comes down to the fact that there is a lot of ambiguity in how humans speak, right? And uh, 
it almost seems like you would have to define your own like verbal grammar to allow people to code in this way. And that means you have to learn that and you cannot just naturally talk, which is kind of kind of interesting. So I'll be curious to see if, if the AI and deep learning can be used to make it more natural. But I guess this is like five years away from us or something along those lines. But anyway, a really cool experiment. So if you're curious to check this one out. Next thing we got here is Ryo.js, a micro framework for Node.js. This is an HTTP framework with APIs that are similar to Express and that is aimed to be super fast. There is a benchmark somewhere here. There we go. There's a Ryo benchmarks. And uh, yes, it is a lot faster even than Fastify, which is really impressive. Um, the interesting bit is that actually we looked at the Pini Peak, um, I believe it was on a podcast like half a year ago, maybe even more, which is even faster than uh, Rayo, but purely because, um, you know, Rayo and Fastify and whatnot, they all rely on Node HTTP module, while Pini Peak goes and taps into the UVS C module for handling HTTP requests, which makes it faster than even Bayer HTTP. <laughs> module, which is quite impressive. But um, there we go. All right, uh, continuing, we got another awesome uh, 3D, or, or I guess pseudo 3D engine called ZDog. This is kind of stuff you can do with it. And the way you do it is super simple. So you literally create a canvas. And then you can do um, things like this. And animating them is like you literally just add rotation and update render graph and then do request animation frame. That's it. This, this is again, just insanely good. And uh, the examples they have over here is just really, really awesome. And all of that is built with code. So you don't like, you don't have to build any models. You can just use primitives to render all these things. And it just looks amazing. So I guess if you have any interest in 3D or pseudo 3D uh, animations, then do check this one out. This seems to be quite damn good. All right, next thing we got here is Tosin, uh, initialized NPM package with everything included from CI to documentation website. So this is sort of all in one scaffolder that uh, basically does the repo for you, including linter, pre-tier, just for testing, uh, code of conduct, licensing, rollup for build system, uh, CI and Netlify deployment and basically everything you can ever want from it, I believe. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Royal Box. This is not quite purely JavaScript, but I thought it was interesting enough to share it here. Uh, it's a project that allows you to transform your Raspberry Pi into a Roku plus Chromecast streaming device. Essentially, it's a tiny app that you install on your uh, Raspberry Pi, and then you can just uh, cast stuff using either Chromecast or Roku protocols to it, which is actually quite damn awesome. So if you are, if you want to roll your own Chromecast uh, device, I guess, with the Raspberry Pi, uh, you can now do that using the Royal Box, um, which seems to be quite good, actually. Right, next thing we got here is function script, a language and specification for turning JavaScript functions into typed HTTP APIs. This is a project from stdlib.com uh, company, which I get, I still cannot get used to say like, you know, there's a company called standard library that just doesn't make sense. And that's a company called standard library that does uh, function as a service deployments. Like none of this makes sense, but uh, there you go. The function script itself is actually pretty cool. So the idea is that you can use the doc type comments to describe the function and basically say how it should behave once deployed. The idea is pretty awesome. And um, I, like I haven't tried it myself, but it looks interesting at least. So if you are in the whole uh, function as a service business, then definitely check it out because this seems to be quite interesting. All right, next thing we got here is Fabulous, a CSS property sidebar for VS Code. Um, yeah, it's basically what it says. It's a sidebar that adds a nice, um, how would you put it? I guess Dreamweaver-like uh, CSS properties outline. This might be handy for cases when you forget things like I do, but I typically use MDN, but maybe, maybe I should try that. Maybe that will save me some time. Anyway, it looks interesting, so if that sounds... Um, Good to you, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Luda, a lightweight and responsive UI framework for modern web development. 
Yeah, UI framework uh, with CSS, and I believe it's built with SAS. It has like a ton of elements and patterns and whatever the hell you can imagine here with examples and everything with a ton of utilities, including flex, floats, shadows, shapes, and whatever you can imagine. Uh, looks pretty, pretty well thought through. So if you're looking for one of those, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Scene.js, a JavaScript and CSS timeline based animation library. Looks really fancy and seems to be quite easy to use. Uh, like you can do animations like this with it in just a few lines of code. It's seriously a quite impressive. Like we, for some reason, we have like a ton of animations this time around and ton of, um, you know, 3D visualization libraries. So yeah, so if that those examples looks interesting, do check it out. Seems to be quite cool. Uh, next thing we got here is fullstackopen.com uh, full stack open course from uh, I believe it's from Finnish University or something like this. Um, and yeah, it basically includes everything you have to know to go full stack in 2019 using Node.js, React, Redux, MongoDB, GraphQL, um, all in one nice course that comprises of nine parts. Uh, they counted from zero. So that's why it ends at eight. It looks quite good. So if you are interested, do check it out, maybe go through it, maybe you will learn something new. All right, next thing we got here is medium to own blog, a command line tool that uh, allows you to switch from medium to your own blog in just a couple of minutes, basically automates everything from uh, getting your medium or extracting your medium archive and uh, porting it to Gatsby blog and then deploying that Gatsby blog to Netlify all in a couple of simple commands, which is really awesome. So if you are migrating from the medium, then check this one out. Uh, maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is trash module from Mr. Cindersaurus that allows you to move uh, files and directories to trash on macOS, Windows and Linux. Um, yeah, it's really straightforward, really simple. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Node Bluetooth Serial Port, a serial I.O. over Bluetooth for Node.js. Um, crazy library that allows you to do, just as it says, the serial Bluetooth I.O. in Node.js. It seems to be predominantly written in C and C++. So if that sounds interesting, if you wanted to get really low level with your Node.js uh, libraries, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Tedious. A Node TDS module for connecting to SQL Server databases. Um, now TDS is something I think I never actually used in my life to, at least you know manually, not through third-party libraries. Uh, but maybe you do, and maybe you needed something like this. So check this one out. Uh, seems to be quite nice and uh, well maintained. Uh, next thing we got here is normalizer uh, normalizes nest JSON according to a schema, a pretty neat utility that allows you to define a schema for um, your JSON and then normalize the data according to that schema. That seems to be quite damn nice. So if you uh, were thinking about a tool like this, do check it out. It seems also quite popular, actually. I'm uh, a bit surprised I never heard about this before, but there you go. Right, next thing we got here is MQTTJS, MQTT client for Node.js and the browser, which is the most interesting part, I guess. So if you're working with MQTT protocol and uh, we're wondering what kind of library you can use for it, do check this one out. Seems to be quite neat and also works in the browser, which is also quite cool. Next thing we got here is React Physics Dagger, uh, sorry, <laughs> React Physics Dragger, not Dagger. Uh, simple no frills horizontal dragger slider for with physics. Um, yeah, it's just basically horizontally dragging thingy where you can put whatever you want as a React component essentially. Also has some like physics uh, smoothing and stuff like this, which looks quite nice and just six kilobytes in size. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Reaptcha, a Google Recapture version two for React. So it's a pretty basic uh, wrapper for Recapture with a bunch of statuses and stuff like this, which is also kind of neat. So if we, for example, if I block all my JavaScript, you'll actually see the status is not loaded, not rendered, and you can basically track it properly, which is uh, kind of cool. So if you're looking to integrate recapture into your apps, uh, React apps, then do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. And next thing we got here, and I think this is the last library we got for today, is React Div 100 VH. 
a React component that solves 100 VH issue in mobile browsers. Because apparently mobile browsers, and I believe Safari specifically, doesn't report correct um, viewport height. So if you do 100 VH by normal, you will be basically your page will be cut out with the uh, uh, bottom bar of the browser, which doesn't make any sense. So this app basically, or this component basically solves that uh, for you by detecting when it's annoying Safari and uh, fixing it basically. All right. Last thing we got here is in, uh, you know, the section of interesting stuff, I guess uh, the article is called you're not praised for the bugs you didn't create the story of programming price strategy. It talks about uh, one of the companies that implemented the strategy of awarding developers for fixing the number of bugs. And the way it's ended up, obviously, is because, you know, if there's a system, if there's a good price, everyone's going to game the system. This is the good hearts law, right? So the developers started introducing the bugs themselves to fix more bugs to get rewarded for that, which, I mean, makes perfect sense. And the overall article is just a discussion of, uh, you know, how the hell, how exactly the development goes over time. Why, if you go slow in the first, in the very beginning of the project, uh, it will actually be better in the long run, you know, sort of uh, thinking out the architecture, leaving the less technical depth and so on and so forth. It's a very interesting discussion in sort of perceived speed of development versus um, project sustainability, I guess, and also a bit of insight into the project, uh, sort of the uh, manager and developer mentality or non-technical stakeholders mentality, I guess, is better word than the manager. Um, yeah, if you are interested in stuff like this, do check this article out. It has some pretty interesting thoughts in here. All right, this is actually from my side. This was episode 65. Uh, you can, as always, find this all on GitHub or on bxjs.dev once it updates. If you guys have any questions or suggestions or links I might have missed, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If you, again, yeah, if you have any questions, ask them away as well. If you are watching this on YouTube or as a VOD on Twitch, um, feel free to join our Discord server where you can ask questions about JavaScript and just talk about stuff or video games as well. We have a pretty nice cozy community over there. Um, if not, then I guess we can just wrap this all up here and uh, go enjoy our weekends. Doesn't seem like there's any questions. Uh, so let's just uh, call it a day for, or I could call it a day. No, call it a street. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Call it a stream. No. You know what? Let's just end it over here. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. This was BXS Weekly episode 65. Thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome weekend or awesome rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.